I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland woodworker. Coming up. When there's a flood, it's just all kind of timber coming down the creek, coming around like uh, freight trains around the bend. The woodwright himself, Roy Underhill. This, this is what I call my universal mortising jig. Master chairmaker, Brian Boggs. We've already gotten a couple inches in. Sure. I just keep making passes until I get to the bottom of where I drilled. The first family of wood turning, the Maltrips. So I had the um, idea of doing a uh, rhubarb table. And the creative genius of Craig Nutt. Plus. And then I'll just mark my sides here with a little nick of my knife. Has your latest project left you unhinged? Popular Woodworking's Megan Fitzpatrick just might have your solution. All of this and more, this time on a special summer edition of the Highland Woodworker. I'm at Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. From tools to schools, this place has it all. Our Moment with a Master series is an up close and personal look at those who have made significant contributions to woodworking. On this episode, we're looking back at some of our favorite moments from the first season. Roy Underhill is the most prominent name in traditional hand tool woodworking. He invited us out to his home, his school, and he told us his story. How many pieces of wood have we got here? Author, educator, <laughs> TV star, master showman, uh, how many and master woodwright, Roy Underhill. Was it? Is it? Yeah, that's the thing. That's what uh, Rubeau says, although it's movable, uh, it's one and the same piece, on seul et même pièce. Now, I think it's, you, know, you guys got the French translation there? Do you, had you translate it back into the original French, as I asked? So, what? Joshua, would you do verse three of Rubo, please, for us? <laughs> you won't find power tools at this unique workshop. Every project created here is done by hand, or self-powered machinery. Roy Underhill is an authority in early American and European woodworking. You English pig dog. Your your mother. <laughs> Your mother was a hamster and your father smelled of elderberries. <laughs> Roy's quick wit, vast knowledge, and amazing storytelling ability makes him a natural teacher. But even the very best teachers have to be taught by someone. Roy didn't have to look far. You could say being right is in his blood. See, I'm a TV woodworker and uh, I learned the trade from my great uncle because he went back, he was a radio woodworker. And, what? Uh, yeah, so he'd teach dovetailing over the radio. No, you and you, furniture you, you building. Gotta be no, kidding. no, no. He taught uh, furniture building, and uh, it was what, you know, he'd do a Chippendale High Boy on a radio series, which they thought was going to be really difficult because you couldn't show anything. But then they realized they didn't have to build a damn thing. You know, all they had to do was make the sound effects. So they go, <laughs> wow, that drawer came out perfect there, didn't it? Great. You know, so this was wonderful back in. So that's who I learned a lot of this. Uh, trade as a TV woodworker from. Growing up in Washington, D.C., way up in the mountainous part. So I'm up in the hills in D.C. and my mama, I always take my ax to school and do what I could on the way home to bring back something interesting. And uh, it was just constant recession. Never could get a job and so I had to keep doing what I like doing. The Woodwright shop on PBS is Roy's own masterpiece theater. He spends a half hour teaching and learning from some of the most notable names in woodworking. His show has been on the air for more than 30 years. Hey, hello again. Welcome back to the Woodwright shop. I'm Roy Underhill. Roy recalls the day when he walked into the North Carolina public television station with more than just an idea in his head. You could say he had a firm grip on what his show should feature. I walked in with an ax and my tool chest and the whole thing, <laughs> full suspender regalia. And you know, and it said, uh, this is, if y'all don't do it, somebody else will, because this is, uh, this is it. 
and uh, I had the sales pitch. And I, but I think, you know, I had all the arguments about how this would work, how this is, you know, familiar, it's in everybody's background, but here's a new approach to it for the way most people live right now. Uh, but I think it was the fact that I had an ax in my hand the whole time I was talking <laughs> that did it, that may have pushed it over for me. So that's my hint to folks who want to push a series, you know, take an ax with you to the uh, pitch meeting. It's always good. Roy is a busy guy. He has a show to host, a shop to keep, and a school to teach. This is where he and his wife slow down. His home is the old McBain grist mill in Graham, North Carolina, a land with plenty of resources and relics from the past. I'm not sure when this was built, they say 1850, but looking at the machinery, it looks like 1870. Because it didn't have a an over you know kind of water wheel, the very picturesque wooden one. Yeah. It was a uh, turbine here. You know, I gotta be careful with the ice here on the mill race. Uh, when there's a flood, it's just all kind of timber coming down the creek, coming around like uh, freight trains around the bend, and then they all end up down here in this huge log jam. All these logs, the walnuts, the, the red cedars, the, uh, those, well, those are the two you want. I mean, right, but, uh, yes. Uh, they all start coming down here, and I have to get down here in the flood, waiting for these logs to come down and try and spot whether they're real straight. That's a walnut. Sure. You, you, you usually tell. And you got to kind of grab it out of the flood mm -hmm. and direct it up here and kind of keep it. But if you go out a little too far, it's like, I mean, you're gone. Yeah. Uh, so you don't cut any snags, but it's just the coolest, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a very frightening thing. So the current but also very would cool. really take you around oh, the yeah, bend. You'd be, you'd be dead. It, yeah, that. you'd be dead yeah. in no time. So I don't recommend that again for students. <laughs> but, you know, I can get out here and uh, try and direct these logs in. Working with wood is more than just craftsmanship, according to Roy. It's human nature. This is such a part of the way we evolved. It is, yeah, it, it is, we just, you know, it became human beings because we were working wood and understanding the grain and looking at the way the blade works. I mean, this has just been with us for hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of years. That's why we're human. That's why we do, you know, we can do this, these kind of things today that we do these marvelous things. But still, you know, that kind of, the original music that we all played, you know, started fading out. And people saying, wait a minute, where, where'd that go? And now, you know, people start to realize where it was. It was working with hand tools, with the wood, with that sound, with the smell, and all that connection. You just, you can't get away from it. You know, we can't get away from it as, as human beings. And that's what's kind of neat. People are admitting that, say, this is always going to be a part of us. The late Ed Maltrop, his son Philip, and his grandson Matt are arguably the first family of artistic wood turning. Let's see their work and hear their great story. Well, as you can see, we have quite a collection here. These are pieces that I've turned, but these are all made out of southern woods, and there's a quite a range of variety. Uh, we are always looking for woods that grow in the area that have unique colors or patterns to them. And as you can see, we like, uh, one of our favorites here is uh, box elder or ash leaf maple because it can contain this bright red color. Uh, we've got here a piece of hackberry. As you can see, this one has developed these patterns in here, a very dark silvery gray against a really light color here. So this contrast provides a lot of interest. The Moultrups are comprised of three generations of artistic woodturners. In the mid-1900s, the late Ed Moultrup took woodturning to a whole new level. Of course, as you know, he was an architect and that was his main source of income at the time. And if this was probably late 50s, early 60s, the market for kind of fine crafts really, there wasn't a lot of that. And so he was making these small pieces and he was he started selling in the, in the signature shop, or which is now called Signature Gallery, in Atlanta. But you know, these were ten dollars, twenty dollars each. You know, so there wasn't a lot. But then, you know, I think he eventually sold one for a hundred or two hundred dollars, and he's like thrilled. Tell us about Ed, because from your perspective, 
I know he was a, an excellent architect. He, he was that. But tell us about you. Well, I, I just re remember how nice he was. When I had read about him two or three times and seen the remarkable nature of his wood and found out he didn't live far from Atlanta, <clears throat> I called him on the phone, told him who I was, and told him I'd like to come out and see his uh, operation. So he showed me how he, how he uh, turned the, the wood. <clears throat> and of course, he gets it down to a pretty smooth state just with the chisel. And, and then he did a lot of just remarkable, kept on sanding and, and, and with steel wool and so forth. And the remarkable thing is how he does it on the inside as well. So I think that these pieces that he has done and his children, uh, son and, grand, and son, grandson have done is just uh, extraordinary. When I first started, uh, you know, I thought, well, should I do, try to do this as a living, look, look at it that way or, or not? And then at the, just about the exact same time, I just passed the bars exam and I thought, well, or should I be a lawyer? You know, and I said, well, you know, I shouldn't worry about that. I should just keep doing it. And then the one I like the best, or it's turned out to start leaning in, in that direction. Probably after about a year, year and a half, the local gallery in Atlanta wanted to have a show because she'd worked with my father and he said, well, it's time to bring Philip in on this. So we did a show and we sold really well. I thought, well, this is really good, you know. There were a couple people who called me up and say, you know, do I have anything for sale? And then, so I was able to sell a few pieces on the side too. When it came to turning big bowls, Ed and his son, Philip, had to do a little digging to develop their signature tools. So he uh, found a salvage yard that uh, sold, you know, all sorts of salvage things. But one of the things they had was some uh, cast off tools and things from Lockheed and all. And they had these uh, tap and die sets with uh, Actually, they can screw, turn screw threads probably in the airplanes they were making over there, but these were not like little ones. Like you'd, These were things like this long, and the steel was like ultra-tempered steel. So he got these things and mound them in there and would put them on an anvil uh, and put in heat in the forge and then pound them out on an anvil and get the tool points that he wanted and sharpen them off of that. And of course, that was a lot heftier uh, type of uh, tool. After using those for years, we finally found a foundry that would actually make our tool points into the hardness that we wanted to. So we have made tool points that we can actually interchange with, with our handles uh, so things go it's faster, it's more efficient. Philip's son, Matt, grew into wood turning. In fact, he was selected to be a part of the Smithsonian's prestigious 40 Under 40 exhibit, making his the third generation of Moultrip work on display. I, I did have two masters in a sense teaching me with, without any um, uh, without any secrecy. You know, everything was open for me to learn and ask questions. And but at a certain point, there's an innate ability that um, you have to have in order to, I guess, perform or, or create on that level. A major difference in the way the Maltrops turn is by using a movable fulcrum pin in the tool rest. This allows them to get leverage as they shape the bowl. The other thing that you'll notice is that our tools are longer than most people use. And one of the reasons is because we'll reach farther rather than keep moving the tool rest close so we can be like within an inch or so, we'll re you know, reach pretty far. As you can see we've already gotten a couple inches in. And sure. I just keep making passes until I get to the bottom of where I drilled. And what, instead of, I won't just have a hole going this way, it'll actually fan out. Right. And, but I'll still have it really thick up here. And after I get all the way to the bottom, I'll take this pin, I'll move it over one notch, and it allows me to get up farther that way. And as I, the more I move it up here, the farther swing I can get. Out further. Swing further and further yeah. to get all the way up here. And so I'll just continue to do that until it's done. They've been painting on you know cave walls and for a thousand years, and the painting industry is very established. And so what we do is, is, is new, and I, th I don't think there are for the rules. I don't think there's uh, nothing set yet, so um, I think there's a lot that's still to be accomplished. When we come back, solving a mortising mystery with popular woodworking's Megan Fitzpatrick. Plus, we're sharing more moments from our first season with chairmaker Brian Boggs and the organic work of Craig Nutt. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. 
Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Put a saw stop in your shop. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rammer bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly, providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools including a long list of industry leading band saws like their new powerful 10 350 14 inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker II presents the PVW blade designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Highland Woodworkers are found all over the world. Email a picture of you and your woodworking project along with your name and where you live to picture at thehighlandwoodworker.com. Mortising for a hinge can be tricky, but Megan Fitzpatrick showed me an easier way, this time on Popular Woodworking's Tips, Tricks, and Techniques. I hear you're going to show us how to lay out a hinge and mortise it in. I am, by hand, but I found a slightly easier way to do it that uses one less tool than I was taught. Well, show me how. All right. Well, normally, um, I start on the top, this is just a fake board here, this isn't a, a real lid obviously, but I always start on this side of the hinge because I can drop it onto my board here and see exactly where it's going to hit the edge. And then I'll just mark my sides here with a little nick of my knife, Whoop. or a big nick of my knife. And then the next thing people t usually teach you to do is to take one marking gauge here, like my tight mark, sure. and set it to the width of the hinge leaf. And then you'll take another gauge here and set it to the thickness of the hinge leaf. Sure. Well, I always use a small router plane to mortise out the bottom of my, uh, well, my mortise. And uh, one day I was looking at that and going, now why am I using three tools when I could set this one aside and just use these two? It's not a big deal, but it's one less tool you have to keep so track of. So it can be of. like its own marking knife, it, too. Yep, I'm using this as a marking knife, in fact. So I've got my two marks where? Here. Here and here, I've got my marks. I've got this one set to the width, uh, width of my hinge. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to mark between the two here. And normally, I'd probably be more careful about, you know, how far I'm going out. And you can, of course, use the edge of the hinge to mark. But I'm always afraid I'm going to, uh, you know, go off my line or move my hinge or what have you. So I prefer to use a knife because that also makes it easier to cut a deeper line that I can then drop my uh, chisel into in just a minute here. So I've got my marks here. And then instead of taking the second gauge here to mark the depth of my mortise, I'm just going to take my 
a small router plane here, and I don't have it tightened up yet. So all I need to do is set this to the thickness of my hinge, which is always tricky to do backward into the camera, but we can get it. So I'm going to drop it in place and just tighten it up by hand there, and then I'll flip it over just to test it. So you can see I've got it set not quite to the bottom, and that's okay because I didn't tighten it down yet. A few taps with my plane adjusting hammer there, and now I'm going to tighten it all the way down because these things are prone to slipping, and you want to make sure you have it in there nice and tight. Sure. So now I can just use this backward to the camera <laughs> to mark across the bottom, which is easier to do when the work is facing you, but that is okay. And then you just proceed on in the typical manner. Grab my chisel here, make sure the flat side is into the work that you're keeping. And then you have a different hammer that I forgot to grab, but that's okay. We can do it with that one. Not the best use of this tool, but there it is. And I've already got my baseline scribed in pretty well here. So then I'm just going to make a series of cuts across the back here. Would you hand me that board, please? Do you want to use a regular? Yeah, I can just use this. It's all right. This works. We improvise. Yeah, but this looks, you know, cooler. All right. Yeah, there you go. That's a little better. You just make a series of cuts across. Not being very careful, it doesn't matter what direction they go in. And I just usually like to come back across the middle here. And then with my router plane already set to the right depth, I can just simply pop out my waist here. And I'm already down to the floor of my mortise. probably come back and deepen in the back lines there so I don't make a hash of it. Whenever I pick my chisel up, I have a really bad habit of flipping around the wrong way, so I always have to check that. Because, of course, as you know, it's important to keep the flat side into the work sure. that you're keeping. And that's one of the easiest mistakes to make, is to flip it around the wrong way. I'm using pine here, which deforms pretty easily. Pick up my router plane again. So I should have done this like a cooking show so that I had it half done already. And then it would probably look more impressive to have perfectly made mortises to show you. Pretty exciting watching the plane at work here. Again, see, I picked it up the wrong way. I had to flip it around. And really, it's no different than the way that you were taught to do it originally, probably, except that you just have one less tool. And it's an excuse to use my favorite tool, which, ooh, got a little tear out there, which is, in fact, the small mortise plane. They're just kind of fun to work with. Have you used one oh, of these yes. before? Yeah, just oh, balance yes. it on I the have, edge there and kind of... And we use it to, to clean out the bottom of... of uh, Dados. Yeah, absolutely. They're also really good for tuning up your tenons. If you cut them on the table saw, then you can come back and refine them with, the, with a mortise plane or a router plane. And I've got a large one as well, but I don't have it here with me today. And then you've got a perfectly fit. Nice job. Except for this tear out here. But we're just yeah. going to cover that up and, and so this don't worry is, about it. This was great as, as a reference. Mm hmm to lay the depth out. I think so. And then you're already ready to start making the cut. When I get back to my shop, I'm going to use this Great. many times. Thank you so much. Thanks. Still ahead, we sit down with chairmaker Brian Box plus Craig Nutt, who is the Whole Foods of furniture making. Stick around. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. I helped develop Masterpiece Wood Finish 
just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Bell Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Bessie, a leader in clamps since 1936. If you know clamps, you know Bessie. Bessie, simply better. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. Master chair maker, designer, tool maker, Brian Box spent the day with us in his Asheville shop sharing his work and design strategies. Really early, I can remember a moment in the second grade when my uh, second grade teacher pointed out that I had some artistic tendencies and might ought to have some art lessons. And that's when my mother started taking me to get art lessons. And so I was painting. And looking back on those paintings, I, I recently noticed there's a lot of trees I was painting. It's just, and I, I basically grew up in the woods. I spent all my time in the woods. I just had a real affinity for trees. But it didn't, it just, I didn't think about it. It was just something I would be in a tree or under a tree or playing in the trees in a tree house or painting trees. I mean, it was all about trees and I just never, never thought about it. That was just my life. And uh, thought I would just gonna be a painter, you know, drawing and painting as a professional artist. When Brian was 19, a visit to the public library changed the course of his life. Well, my eye caught James Krenov's book, The Fine Art of Cabinet Making. And f for me, that just seemed like a comic oxymoron. I mean, how could you, it's cabinet making, it's not fine art. So I, I pulled it just to kind of thumb through it and I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. Had never had any experience woodwork, or even considered woodworking, never had shop class in high school. I mean, I was sucked in. and. The reason that I didn't just go out and buy a bunch of equipment and set up shop right then and there is I didn't have any money. So I, I dreamed about it for a little while. Eventually ran across a book in my dad's house called Make a Chair from a Tree by John Alexander. And that one was refreshing for a couple of reasons. One, I loved the picture on the cover and that was my first chair eventually. But the simplicity of it, I love the physicality of it, you know, just ripping trees apart and carving each part to shape. And the fact that I could set up my first shop for $50, that was rather attractive. So I jumped into chairs, you know, all the way. This is a place where I just like to cut it, not fuss too much, because I like it to look fresh, not too labored over. Every woodworker needs to have the tools of their trade on hand. But Brian was finding that the tools in his shop could use some improving. So he took a hands-on approach. And I was trying to take an old Kunz spoke shave, which I bought for new for $12, and trying to get a Krenov quality plain result from it. And I replaced everything but the initial casting and finally gave up and made one from scratch. And that started into a whole thing that led up to designing for Lee Nielsen more recently. This is the first tool I ever made. Uh, this is a tobacco knife I built when I was about 19. Uh, I learned how to cut tobacco when I was 13 years old. It was my first job ever. Yeah. And I cut tobacco every season until I was 23. But this, uh, it was about time to get a knife. I did not like the ones that were made because they just had straight handles and the blade I didn't like the shape of the blade 
and it hurt. I, I wanted a lightweight springy handle because when you cut tobacco, you grab the plant like this and then you spear it up. But well, when you hit that spear, the knife goes like this and it pulls on a little muscle here. Well, you, if you're cutting a thousand sticks a day, that's 6,000 plants. That's 6,000 of these over a six hour period or seven hour period. That's intense. You were working on details back then, oh, evaluating yeah. all the tools. <laughs> That's bet. where Brian Boggs came yeah. from. Now, is Thomas Lee Nielsen coming out with us? <laughs> I don't think their clientele are really big into cutting tobacco. <laughs> Erector sets were also big when Brian was a kid. Now he is using what looks to be an industrial strength erector set to cut corners and much, much more. I can just set that up in here and cut it without building a jig for it. So I just, this is what I call my universal mortising jig. Let's see, this is going to have to go this way. So I'll have to turn this around and turn this around and set this up so that it moves this way. It supports a lot of creative work in engineering. But even though the aluminum extrusion is, you know, about 80 cents a linear inch now, in the long run, it's a much less expensive, more efficient way to build a lot of jigs. That does, that does a beautiful job. And it's going to be within a thousandth or two of three, of three eighths. Even good enough for my mother-in-law. That's right. Yes, very good. She'll get that caliper out, won't she? All right, she will. <laughs> but the creative work doesn't stop there. His chair designs are captivating. The outdoor chairs that I've been making lately, even though they, re they remind people of Adirondack, they're not structured like any chair I've ever seen. The joints are not like any chair I've ever seen. The guitar chair that I've been working on recently I've never seen a structure like that before. So it's not building on a traditional form, but it does build on traditional joinery concepts and a very traditional old school grounded sense of how wood works, how adhesives work. I want each form to be as comfortable as it can possibly be. I don't make conscious compromises there. It's a lot of fun being able to play like that. To just, you know, let ideas download in whatever form they are and go with that. And just keep listening to what the chair is trying to be and let it go. Instead of trying to make an Adirondack chair or trying to make a ladder back chair or trying to make a craftsman style chair, just let Let's let something happen that's trying to be, and I really think that's, that's where these designs come from. They're already there, they're just trying to find a place to be built. Craig Nutt's organic ideas set him apart from any woodworker I have ever known. Let's see what's growing in Craig's Tennessee shop. I've always been a maker, I've always been uh, interested in how things were made and how they were put together. Um, you know, I was uh, uh, terribly disappointed as a kid when I couldn't find my toolbox in my uh, uh, Christmas stocking. Well, this is a recycling piece. You know, everything these days you need to be thinking about how to recycle it back into nature. And so I, uh, you know, there's a, a book that a lot of us read when uh, back in the 70s, I think, uh, called uh, by John Alexander, Make a Chair from a Tree. Sure. And uh, so I thought, well, what about making a tree from a chair? If I <laughs> want to recycle uh, my furniture back to the, uh, uh, back into a tree, um, you know, I've made, a, I've made a chair from a tree and that's pretty hard. I found out that it's really even harder to put it back into a tree. And you've got all the parts here, it looks It's like. all the parts to the chair. It's a, a chair I picked up at Habitat for Humanities. And, uh, you know, I think it makes a pretty good piece of firewood. As a tree, it doesn't quite make it, I'm afraid. And so you carved bark back onto carved the parts. Bark back and, onto oh, it. Oh, that's wonderful. You got glue blocks over there. and uh, Oh, the whole chair is in there. It's, it, it's one whole chair. Yep. Well... If it's a tree. <laughs> it's a start. I love it. 
Craig Nutt's hand-built studio is in this rustic Tennessee setting. This is the place where Craig's left and right brain intersect. Well, I started out in school in, uh, in pre-med and, um, you know, most of my first years in, in college were things like, you know, mathematics and chemistry and biology. Uh, and then I really got introduced to uh, some art courses and really got interested in uh, painting and oil painting. From there, Craig began restoring antique furniture and mastering his woodworking skills. His organic works of functional art have appeared in galleries and exhibitions all across North America, earning him numerous awards, commissions, and acclaim. Eventually I started thinking that, that the furniture could be artwork as well and I could kind of put, uh, invest all that creative energy that I had been spreading out in music and painting into making furniture that was uniquely my own. I mean, it's kind of a long road to the, uh, to the vegetable pieces because I, I started doing very straightforward uh, uh, functional pieces of furniture initially. Uh, but I had always been growing a vegetable garden ever since I started making uh, furniture. We had uh, uh, gardened uh, as much as anything as a means of survival, but also got addicted to fresh organic food and uh, and I think the vegetable pieces started when I was, uh, got in a situation where I didn't have a place to garden at that time. Craig's garden of furniture is fascinating in form and in function. And just like tending his outdoor garden, Craig has a unique process for producing these fine pieces. This piece is a, um, a table to seat six. And so I had the, um, idea of doing a uh, rhubarb table and I usually start with a, uh, a scale model and I kind of think of these they're not really uh, I don't spend a lot of time on the models the, I don't want the model to be the actual piece and to get that involved they're just stuck together with hot melt glue uh, they're uh, kind of worked out roughed out as quickly as I can so I don't get attached to the model and if the uh, if the piece isn't working out you know, I feel comfortable about like ripping a leg off of it and redoing the legs or changing the top. Sure. Um, and you haven't wasted a big piece of wood in all that time. Exactly. I'm working on laying the top out and uh, trying to mark out the way the carving is going to be on it. Uh, I'm uh, kind of sketching out just the segments of the top and then I'm uh, kind of laying out uh, the way the um, the way the leaves are going to kind of undulate in the top. I'm trying to be a little irregular about it and so it has an organic look to it. Um, so I'll mark these leaves out and then I'll kind of indicate here approximately how it's going to be carved. These will be uh, scooped out here on the top and these hollows here will be will be scooped out on the bottom side so the edge of the top rolls and it's really the it's really where this edge goes that defines how you perceive the shape of the top. Uh, they will be, we'll be cut out here in between the leaves so they'll look like they uh, lap over one another. So again, your, your model really helps you lay this out. Exactly. Well, that's wonderful. The pedestal is just beautiful. Now, the pedestal is what in, in your mind? The, the pedestal are the, is uh, rhubarb stalks that uh, wow. um, are kind of joined uh, in a bunch. Uh, it, we can take the top off. Craig, I just love this. Tell me about it. How did you make it? Well, it's basically the, the legs are um, joined to a core. We'll turn it upside down and sure. you can see underneath it. It's a hexagonal core. And then these are have a mortise and tenon joint between the legs and the core. And then these are hollowed out. Those are hollowed out like, a, like the inside of a rhubarb stalk. All organic. All organic. That's the Craig Nut way. <laughs> that is. <laughs> organic, outside of the box, and open-minded. A lot of people will uh, dismiss their best ideas before they have a ch chance to find out if they're a good idea or not. And just because uh, your initial take on it is oh, this is ridiculous, this is stupid, nobody would buy this, nobody would put this in their home. I mean, all those things are working against you uh, following your impulses and, and uh, 
and exploring to see if they go anywhere. You know, maybe you find out after working with them for a while that they really are stupid ideas. And, uh, but being open to that kind of thing kind of opened some doors for me. I think when you make something that's well made, it communicates something and it communicates something about uh, what I think is, a, is a, an ethic of craftsmanship, and which is about uh, uh, making a world that is, is worth taking into another generation. Thank you so much for watching this special episode of The Highland Woodworker. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today.